I call Carmel Cipolloni. Mr Speaker, we had much discussion about that, this bill in our caucus, and it is with some major reservations that we will be supporting the bill to select committee, uh, but we will be raising those concerns at select committee, and today I will highlight some of those very serious concerns that we have um, with the Minister and with the National Government. I am going to start, Mr Speaker, by saying why we will support this bill, or the aspects of the bill that we can support. Um, and Mr. Bill, uh, Mr Speaker, really that starts with the, the fact that 19-year-olds um, will have access to the youth service and all the wraparound supports that come with that youth service. And Mr Speaker, we support the support of oh, that doesn't make sense. We support the idea that we put measures in place to ensure that our young people and all beneficiaries actually should have access to this, have access to, to going on to higher level education, have access and support to get into work. Uh, Mr Speaker, we do not disagree with the fact that our, our youth who are beneficiaries um, should have access to um, not only education but budgeting support and, if they are young parents, parenting programmes. We support that. We support the fact that in here there is a very small, but at least it is um, a, a monetary incentive, a $10 a week incentive payment um, for those that meet their obligations. It is good to see a little bit of carrot rather than the stick that we've constantly seen from the national government. But some of the concerns we have, Mr Speaker, um, uh, I'm going to start with actually the fact that the, even the purpose of the bill, these young people are deemed as being at risk of long term welfare dependency. I want to say, Mr. Speaker, how can the government assess these young people from such a, a young age of being at risk? of welfare dependency. It is a stigma that that government has already attached to them. And actually, Mr Speaker, it's part of the national government and the MSD's predictive risk model framework for risk of long-term welfare dependency that actually we're a little bit uncomfortable with. And the reason we're uncomfortable with this predictive risk model is the fact that no beneficiary is informed that they are being rated in any way as being long, medium or high risk of welfare dependency. They're not being told they're being rated. They're not being told what they're being rated for or, or what the measures that they're being rated against. They're just being assessed. They're actually being used in some ways, Mr Speaker, as research guinea pigs, and they don't even realise that that's happened. And I've got real concern that that's a breach of their privacy, because when you're being ranked or rated by a government department for anything, you at least should have the right to know what you're being rated and ranked for and what measures are in place for that. Mr Speaker, we've got real concerns about the general culture of wins, and in some ways that's why we will support this bill, because if our young people are getting support from the youth service rather than the wins officers that are providing very poor support actually under the national government, not because there aren't good people in there wanting to do a good job, but because they're working under a framework, a culture, a toxic culture that's been created by that national government. So Mr Speaker, that's one of the reasons we have to support them, uh, this bill, because if it takes our young people out of that toxic um, culture of work and income New Zealand and provides them with wraparound services and support that actually work and income New Zealand should be offering, then Mr Speaker, we have no choice but to support that. We've got real concerns in general about the way beneficiaries are being treated, and that, that actually... Um, that actually includes our young people here, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, when we're talking about the $10 incentive that these young people are going to get, as I said, it's good to see a little bit of carrot, but that's not going to go far. Mr Speaker, when we look at what this bill is asking, it's actually saying that these young people, 19-year-old parents, will be required to go into full-time study or work. Um, in some instances, when their child is six months old. Now, I've I'm not opposed to young people being put into study or being encouraged to go into study or work, but there's got to be some discretion in terms of people's different circumstances. And I'm, I'm unsure of whether or not Work and Income New Zealand or the Youth Service or the government, for that matter, is able to discern or, or use their discretion to decide when that should be or shouldn't be used. So we saw on the website when looking this up, 
that they will be required, if there is a team parenting unit, to go into full-time study or work when the child is six months old. If there is no team parenting unit within their area, it will be when that child is a year old. So there is a little bit of a difference here, well, actually a huge difference, between the way in which these young parents are going to be treated compared to the 20-year or older sole parent who actually doesn't have to go into part-time work or study until their youngest child turns five at the moment, but we know that the government is looking at shifting that to three, unless, because the government implemented this other measure, they have a subsequent child on a benefit and then have to go into part-time work or study at one, So uh, uh, when that child turns one. So there's a differentiation here between the way young parents are being treated compared to the way parents who are 20 years or older are being treated. And Mr Speaker, we all know in this House whether or not we are in this situation ourselves that it is a really hard task, not just being a sole parent, but being a young parent. And so I, I, I want to have faith in the national government that they will provide the supports that these young people need, these young parents need, but how can I have faith given some of the things that we've seen recently? Now the Minister says that she wants to have a focus on making sure that they are in education, that they are in employment, and that the national government is focused on ensuring that their aspirations are met. But the reality is, from what we've seen with people on the job seekers benefit, is it hasn't been about helping people realise their aspirations, it's been about getting them off benefits regardless of whether or not they are going into work. And we saw that actually recently with the Minister's own numbers that came out at the end of March where there were 11,696 benefit cancellations and of that 11,696 benefit cancellations only 2,410 of them were cancelled because they obtained work. What happened to the rest? Well, actually, the Minister doesn't care what happened to the rest. Actually, the Minister said in Select Committee during estimates that it's not necessarily about going on to, an uh, on to employment, it's about going into independence. <laughs> now, how independent can someone be if not only they are no longer in receipt of a benefit, but they are not in paid employment? How independent can someone be? But did the minister care? No. Are the national government collecting information on what happens to people when they go off benefits? No. no. Now, no. <laughs> shouldn't we therefore be concerned that the same behaviour, the same actions, the same process is potentially going to be rolled out here with our very vulnerable young people? Well, yes, we should be concerned, and we are concerned, and we will be monitoring this very closely when it goes to Select Committee to make sure, well, to try and make sure that the same things don't happen with these young people. The Minister says she's aspirational for these young people that are on benefits. Well, simp I simply just don't believe that, Mr Speaker. In fact, I want to go back to Select Committee where her own CEO of MST um, said when asked, aren't you concerned about these people who have had benefits cancelled but have not gone on to work? Her own MSD CEO said, well, they have other means. Uh, Mr Speaker, if someone's not in receipt of income from work or from a benefit, then what does he mean by other means? She sat there, the minister sat there, and she nodded her head like that was true. Well, if they've got no income coming in from work, they've got no income coming in from benefit, the numbers of those who have gone on to further study is minute. The number of those who had benefits cancelled because of the fact that they had passed away or moved overseas um, or their marital status had changed was minute. What are the other means that the minister is talking well that the minister's official is talking about? And to be completely honest, Mr Speaker, we were left there gobsmacked going, well actually how could they make money if they're not getting any money from paid work or from an uh, or from a benefit? And the only answers we could come up with were crying possibly, begging on the street, or um, prostitution. Three, three examples of other means that that's perhaps, what the, that's perhaps what the minister is implying when they talk about independence, independent from the state, obviously independent from, um, uh, from paid employment because there's no information to prove that they're going on to work. We have real reservations about this bill, Mr Speaker, but we will be supporting it to select committee um, and we will be having robust discussion at that 
Debt Select Committee to make sure we hold the government to account on the way in which they treat our young parents, our young people who are in receipt of a benefit. Thank you.